Well, good afternoon. Today we're announcing that we're abolishing the 457 visas. We are ensuring that Australian jobs and Australian values are first, are placed first. Australia is the most successful multicultural society in the world. We are truly an immigration nation. Today and in years past, Snowy Mountain Scheme built by 100,000 workers who came, many of them, from war-shattered Europe. So we have and we always will be an immigration nation, but we must ensure that the foundation of that success is maintained and the foundation is that our migration system is seen to work in the national interest. It's seen to deliver for Australians. It's seen to ensure that Australian jobs are filled by Australians wherever possible and that foreign workers are brought into Australia in order to fill critical skill gaps and not brought in simply because an employer uh, finds it easier to recruit a foreign worker than go to the trouble of hiring an Australian. Now, the Labor Party, of course, consist, consisted of Olympic champions in the issuance of 457 visas. Bill Shorten, the gold medal winner among them all. During his time, the number of 457s increased by two thirds during the last term of the Labor government. And less than 10 per cent of that increase went to the mining sector. So this wasn't about the mining boom and the need to bring in new skilled workers. These were people working as labourers, working flipping burgers. The fact is that Bill Shorten likes to talk about Australian jobs, but whenever he's had the opportunity in government to protect them, he's failed them. So we're bringing the 457 visa class to an end. It's lost its credibility. We will replace it with two new temporary skills visas. The minister will go into some more detail on them, but they will be very different. Firstly, there will be a two-year visa stream with a broader list of occupations, reduced, I might say, from the current list by over 200. So this is a very substantial reduction in the list of skills that qualify for these visas. There will be a two-year visa, and that will require, as will a second visa for four years, two years work experience, prior work experience. That is not the case at the moment. It will require, in the case of the four-year visa, a higher standard of English. It will require a full, a proper police record, a criminal check, at the, which is not the case at the moment. It will require, in, in almost all cases, in the majority of cases, uh, mandatory labour market testing. Again, a very significant change. Now, these new visas will ensure that Australian businesses have access to the workers from overseas they need to fill real skill gaps, but not otherwise. And that Australians, wherever possible, where jobs are, uh, vacancies are there, where job opportunities are there, Australians will be able to fill them. This is critically important. Believe me, we should not underestimate either our success as a multicultural society or the fact that our success is built on a foundation of confidence by the Australian people that it is their government and their government alone that determines in the national interest who comes here and the terms on which they come and how long they stay. Now, whether it is on border protection and Labor's shameful record on, on uh, people smuggling, recall 50,000 unauthorised arrivals, over 1,200 deaths at, deaths at sea, that was Labor's record on the borders. They failed to keep our borders secure and they failed to manage a 457 system, a temporary uh, migration system, in the national interest. We're changing that. The 457 visa is abolished. It will be replaced by a new system that will be manifestly, rigorously, resolutely conducted in the national interest to put Australians and Australian jobs first. That's our commitment. Australian jobs, Australian values. Minister. Oh, Prime Minister, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll just go into a little bit of detail, but uh, the abolition of the 457 visa program obviously is 
uh, an attempt to clean up Labor's mess. Uh, Labor presided over a policy which got out of control by their own admission. And what we are doing is making some significant changes uh, in abolishing the program but uh, introducing a temporary skills shortage visa to, through two streams, uh, one a short term, one a medium term. Uh, and by doing that, we, we restore integrity uh, to this uh, visa program. At the moment, the uh, existing 457 visa program uh, is conducted for a period of four years, but essentially it's open-ended and it results in many cases in a migration outcome. That is somebody going into permanent residency and becoming a citizen, which is a significant part of the attraction to using the 457 visa. What we propose is that under the temporary skills shortage visa short-term stream, there will be a two-year visa uh, with the option of two years, but there will not be permanent residency outcome at the end of that. In relation to the medium term stream, which as the Prime Minister pointed out, is targeted at higher skills, a much shorter skills list uh, that will be for a period of four years, uh, can be applied for onshore or offshore, uh, and it's a significant tightening of the way in which uh, that program operates. Uh, the other significant aspect is the work experience, which uh, doesn't apply now, and also uh, some mandated arrangements in relation to market testing. So at the moment, quite an open process which doesn't put uh, any onus really in practical terms uh, on the person applying for the 457 visa. Uh, we significantly tighten up uh, those arrangements as well. This is about putting Australians first for Australian jobs and it is about making sure that where those jobs can't be filled, particularly in regional areas, uh, that there is the ability to bring in that overseas worker into that job uh, that can't be filled by an Australian worker. Uh, so this is a significant uh, announcement and I'm very pleased that uh, the Prime Minister and I have been working on this for some time and I think this will make a big difference uh, to young Australians in particular who would have uh, been bewildered by Bill Shorten's announcement uh, at the time of the arrangement with McDonald's and the other fast food outlets that displaced young Australian workers out of work and put foreign workers into those jobs. Uh, so it does make a big change, and I think it'll be welcomed by all Australians. Uh, so for those people uh, that are here on a 457 visa at the moment, uh, there'll be a grandfathering arrangement. They'll continue under the conditions of that visa. With the four-year visa, the new one you're thinking of bringing in, does that uh, are people on that enabled to apply for permanent residency at the end of it? And on both of the new classes of visa, are you saying there are 200 fewer occupations they'll be applicable for than currently? Uh, yes, yes to the first part, Phil. Uh, and the second uh, answer is that uh, it's reduced by 200 the number of classifications uh, in the short term. And it goes back even further. So it's even tighter for the medium term one. And as I say, that's a four year as opposed to two. The prospect of permanent residency out of it. Um, and typically that might apply, for example, to high skilled health workers uh, but certainly people of higher skills would be applying under that four year or that medium so term. Will the four year visa apply to? 183. What will the four year visa testing entail and, and will the application fees remain the same? I think it's about $1,060 at the moment for the applicant. Will that remain the same or will that be increased? Uh, so in relation to the advertising, uh, the, ab the advertising will be required uh, whereas it's not at the moment. Um, the fee is $1,150 uh, for the, I'll just get the actual figure for you, $1,150 for the first uh, short term category and the medium term is $2,400. Mr Turnbull, what numbers, what difference will this make on the estimates in terms of people coming in say over the next four years and secondly, have you run this past major employer groups and what's their reaction? Well, let me deal with the numbers first and then Peter uh, can elaborate. Um, at the moment, there are around uh, 95,000 uh, uh, 457 visa holders uh, in Australia. Uh, and that, um, that's the current figure, of course. You know, they were issued, some of them, a very long time ago. As uh, Peter said, they're issued in the first instance for four years and can be rolled over onshore. So they often do end up as being a permanent migration outcome. 
Uh, now, we're, we are changing that. So, as you know, the two-year visa, uh, up to two years, the short-term visa, can be uh, renewed for two years onshore, and then the holder would have to go offshore if they wanted to, if their employer wanted them to apply again. Uh, and the four-year visa is, is much more focused on long on strategic skill gaps that are more longer term. These skill, I'm sorry. Do you have estimates? Yeah, let me let, let me just go on. The uh, because we are narrowing significantly the number of occupations, and we are increasing the qualifications that visa applicants need to have. Uh, it is our expectation that all other things being equal, you will see a material reduction over time of people uh, working on these temporary visas. But, Michelle, it depends upon all other things being equal, and, and which they're, they're, they're not. So it depends on the demands of the economy, emerging skill gaps, changes in the economy. So it's a, the, the fact is that the, the migration program should only operate in our national interest. This is all about Australia's interest. This is about jobs for Australians. It's about growing the Australian economy so that Australian families can realise their dreams, that Australian businesses can invest and employ and get ahead. That's what it's all about. And so this rigorous focus, this laser-like focus on our national interest will ensure that where skill gaps arise and can't be filled by Australians, then foreign workers can come in, but not otherwise. Minister. Uh, well, Michelle, just to go to the second uh, part of your question in relation to uh, employer groups, we have had some discussions with employer groups. It comes off the back, remember, of uh, the John Azarius review that was done to have a look at uh, this whole space, and uh, we've picked up uh, many of the recommendations that he made in that review. Uh, I'll let the groups speak for themselves, but uh, uh, by and large, there's acceptance and, and welcoming of uh, many components of what, uh, what we've announced today. One of the problems in this space has been the, the, the unwillingness of young Australians, particularly in areas of high unemployment, to take the jobs that people on 457s are prepared to do. Um, MPs have talked about job snobs in, 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 in that case. Um, what, Not are you this doing MP. On, what, what are you doing on, on the, that side of the equation? Is there a need to also make changes to the welfare system to force people to take those jobs that otherwise 457 visa holders would take? Well, can I say to you that the, all of the, the whole welfare system is designed to provide real incentives for employment in every respect, and, and we have produced innovative measures like the PATH program, you know, the, uh, the uh, prepare, uh, trial, hire program. It's a, it, is a, it is a fundamental focus of all of our reforms in welfare to fulfil that great observation uh, of John Howard's that the best form of welfare is a job. Pauline Hanson has already claimed credit for this, saying that the tough talk and the decision to ban 457s is because of One Nation's uh, uh, rhetoric. What's your response to that? Uh, this, is a, this is a decision of my government uh, and uh, you know, it's a, it is a, <laughs> it's a decision of the government and as, as uh, Peter said, it's uh, followed on from a very careful examination of many of these issues by John Azarius. Uh, this has been a careful exercise in policy uh, development, and we're announcing the conclusions today. When we have the, when we have the next uh, mining construction boom, will resources companies be able to quickly hire workers again, or are they going to be looking at shortages? Well, this is this is a very this is a pro, the new arrangements are focused on skill shortages and skill gaps. And of course, if there was, as I said earlier and answered a question from Michelle Grattan, if new economic circumstances change, and they will, of course, and new skill gaps or greater skill gaps emerge, then this has the flexibility to meet that. It is a, it's a very responsive approach. But the fundamental difference is that it is, it, is, it is focused relentlessly on the national interest and on ensuring that temporary uh, migration visas are not a passport for foreigners to take up jobs that could and should be filled by Australians. Australian jobs for Australians first. That's the focus. That's what this will deliver. Peter, do you want to? The 457 system was based on, Philip, this was based on the 
based solely on filling skill shortages. So aren't you just changing the name? Well, under, <laughs> well, under, under Labor's program, so their 457 program existed to people in the employment categories, for example, of potters, of driving instructors, of auctioneers, uh, even workplace relations advisors, you might be surprised to hear. Uh, so we've clamped down on that considerably. And the whole focus here is, as the Prime Minister says, firstly, to put Australians into jobs. If there is a skill shortage and the job can't be filled, uh, then we look at uh, what the purpose of the program was originally designed to do, and that is provide uh, that person for that job. But the way in which it was used and abused by Labor, as the Prime Minister pointed out before, meant that the number of 457 holders blew out to 110,000 when Bill Shorten was last in government. And we have steadily reduced that down to 95,000. And we have, in addition to the announcements today, put in place extra measures which have already tightened up the use of 457 visas. And if we need to do more, we will. Can I take it, Prime Minister? Okay, just OK. okay just Minister, there was a thing before to the government on this back in 2014. It said it shouldn't be the business that does the labour market testing, and so you have to check the market rates. We, we need to get a 457. Um, it should be an independent agency that does that. Are you going to implement that recommendation? No, we, we're going to, uh, to work with the companies uh, to make sure that they understand that they need to advertise, they need to demonstrate it, uh, and they will, or they'll be in breach. Uh, if they're in breach, they won't be sponsoring then the next applicant uh, or the next position that they need to be filled. There will also be a particular focus on companies that have uh, an unnecessarily high proportion of 457 or foreign workers in jobs as well. So there will be a number of ways in which we can clamp down. And as I say, we've already implemented some of that, which has seen the numbers drop now down to sub 100,000 compared to the 110,000 under Labor. North Korea. Can you tell the Australian people why they should be interested in what's happening on the North Korean peninsula? Are you concerned, is it your advice, that North Korea may reach a stage where its missiles could be delivered to Australia? The North Korea regime is a reckless and dangerous threat to peace and stability in our region and indeed in the world. That's why we have joined with other nations, including our ally, the United States, to put pressure on North Korea to stop its dangerous and reckless conduct. But the real obligation, the heaviest obligation, is on China, because China is the nation that has the greatest leverage over North Korea. It has the greatest obligation and responsibility to bring North Korea back into a realm of at least responsibility in terms of its engagement with its neighbours. The North Korean regime is a threat to the peace of the region, it's a threat to all of the, uh, re the, the, its neighbours in the region, and if it were able to obtain a develop a missile that could travel as far as the United States with a warhead or as far as Australia, then it obviously could threaten Australia and indeed the United States. But as Vice President Sp uh, Pence said, the strategic patience has come to an end. And so what we're now looking forward to is action from China. Clearly the United States and China are speaking very closely about this and we welcome that in all of my engagements uh, with Chinese leaders uh, over the years. I have always stressed the responsibility of China to take action with respect to North Korea's conduct. Now, the Chinese often express frustration with North Korea uh, and disappointment, uh, but the fact is that they have the overwhelming leverage over the North Korea regime. So, so the, the eyes of the world are now on Beijing, and Beijing has to step up and bring this reckless threat to the peace and stability of our region to an end. What would you like to see China do, for example, should they restrict oil imports to North Korea, and how will Australia respond if there is another nuclear test? Well, can I say that China should do whatever it takes to, and it, and there, it has many avenues, and it has enormous leverage over North Korea, as everyone understands. It has 
obviously the longest border, the most important by far economic relationship. Uh, it has the ability, if it chooses to exercise it, uh, to uh, bring, to pull North Korea back uh, into at least the position where it is not threatening uh, to rain down uh, devastation on its neighbours, which is what they've been, uh, they've been doing. So the, 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 the onus really is on China. It's, it, is a, it is a fact that China has the greatest influence over North Korea, and the time has come for the Chinese government to exercise it. Mr. 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 Chris's question, though, what would be your message to Australians? I know over Easter, family and friends wanted to ask me about North Korea. They're quite worried by the reports. What's your message on it? My message is to Australians that their government, my government, is committed to ensuring that the North Korean regime acts responsibly. Now, we don't have the leverage that China does. We obviously don't have the military might that the United States does. But what we are able to do is to provide the solidarity and the influence we can in international forums and in our direct engagement with other nations. I had uh, the Chinese Premier, Li Keqiang, here only a little while ago. And this issue I raised with him, as I've raised it with the President, uh, Xi Jinping. So we, we add our voice uh, to, the, to the voice of many other nations in the region, supporting the efforts to bring this, this uh, reckless conduct to an end. So that's, that, that, is, that is our commitment. And I believe now uh, the, the uh, conversations, uh, the engagement between China and the United States is such that I am, I am optimistic, but not unduly so, I'm optimistic that a resolution can be found because, as Vice President Pence said in a statement, I think that will concentrate the minds of all involved. The strategic patience has come to an end. You've got a meeting tomorrow with the gas majors. Um, will it be the same message as last month where you're threatening export controls unless they can free up more for domestic supply, or is there some other approach you're going to take tomorrow in that meeting? Well, the, we'll, we'll be looking forward to the meeting with the gas producers tomorrow. As you know, uh, we have ensured that there is a guarantee of gas for peaking power purposes uh, in the forthcoming summer, so that's been a very important achievement. But it is absolutely vital that Australian industries, Australian businesses, Australian families have the gas they need at a price they can afford. It is not acceptable for Australia to be shortly the world's largest exporter of LNG and yet to have a gas shortage on the East Coast in its domestic market. That is clearly unacceptable. And I'll be continuing the discussions, and the industry knows exactly where I stand and where my government stands, we will defend the energy security of Australians and gas supply, reliable and affordable supply, is a key part of that. So I look forward to further discussions with the industry. We've made a lot of progress already. We've made a lot of progress already, but there is more to come. And on that note, thank you all very much. <laughs>